Thank you, Nisma. Our respected dignitaries and friends. Uh, we'll be short enough, uh, no formal speeches. Uh, this is plenary session and we'll try to uh, take more advantage of it. So travel media, we're talking about travel media. Travel media has come a long way. Maps and guidebooks are in mobile and they not only give information but seek contributors, contributions of users. Era of user generated content has made all experts in photography, videography, and travel writing. All of us are bloggers to some extent, vloggers also, and content creators. Most popular platforms like Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter all have nothing but our posts, pictures, and videos. And we still believe they are platforms we need to be and market our products. Fear of missing out, which is popularly called FOMO, is on train. We wish birthdays to the ones with whom we share roofs. In this context, travel is not limited to spirituality, rejuvenation only, but to a large extent, it is showing to our friends and families also. On this matter, we don't want to be missed among friends visiting exotic places, and we present a proof that we have been to that place with Facebook posts and Instagram pictures. Uh, we'll be doing more conversations about it, so we, I'd like to present some uh, beautiful facts that I've uh, noted. Uh, we are now doing more conversation on bots than with our spouse. Over 50% of the world population is below 30 years. They are all the time online. Today, college students, college goers have not leaked postage stamp on envelope so far. Two in three gets news from social media. 93 de buying decisions are influenced by social media. 80% of our mobile consumption is video only. More people own, this is worldwide, worldwide fact, more people own mobile than toothbrush. We don't have choice. We don't have choice not to follow this, but how to transform ourselves digitally. So with this note, uh, I'd like to welcome you all on this session. Uh, on our local note, I'd like to present a few facts. Nepal has been coming with beautiful destinations. Every year we have come up with new destinations in, among the internal tourism, internal tourists. Uh, places like Bar Park, Rara, Khoptar, Mardi Himal, they have come up uh, popular being once in a year every year, and that is all because of social media, thanks to that. Uh, so in this panel session, we shall be seeing different aspects of travel media, how much we travel industry uh, can benefit out of it, and what shall be doing further uh, to get more benefits. So help me welcome distinguished panelists. Let me start with uh, Nori Quintus. Nori is editor at large with National Geography Travel and Travel. She is independent communication consultant, Nori. And we have what, Yannike, if I'm not pronounced, uh, I think I've pronounced her correctly. Yannike, right? Yannike Hansen. She is president of Profe Professional Travel Blogger Association, PTBA. And Lex Limbu, who is renowned blogger. So let's start with uh, your submission first. We have talked about the session and the theme. So I'll start with Nori, uh, and then we'll move to uh, Yannicke and Lex. So uh, let's keep in mind our time even, because uh, I'm afraid Nori has to leave for uh, she has flight to catch up. Uh, we'll be doing more of conversation, and we'll try to uh, take uh, questions from the floor even. So uh, let's start with your submission first. Hello. Uh, first of all, namaste. I wanted to thank everyone. Thank you for inviting me. I am so looking forward to this panel. I do have to do an Irish goodbye at about 12.30, um, so I apologize in advance if I've got to run off, um, because I'm sure the conversation will go, will go very well. But um, just to explain a little bit more of my background, I'm an editor-at-large at National Geographic Traveler magazine and National Geographic Travel Media. And um, 
I think judging from this, from this panel, I think I'm the gray beard in this room. Um, I have definitely come, I came into the business when there was no such thing as uh, influencers and uh, digital media even. So I have seen the gamut, I've seen the change, and it's actually been quite exciting to be on the front row um, working at National Geographic and seeing the change. So Legacy Media, National Geographic, 130 years old, it is now also one of the biggest digital brands. So we have made the switch, not necessarily painlessly, but we've certainly made the switch. So we've seen the entire gamut, and I've been at the front seat of, of a lot of that. So I think the perspective that I'll, I'll come across, I'm not a digital technical expert, um, but to me what's important is that what has not changed, a lot has changed, but what has not changed is that storytelling, narrative, messaging. That's really important. And I come from a place where it is um, platform agnostic. So it's, it really, for me, it's not so much the media as the, uh, as the messaging. Thank you. Um, I've been in marketing for 17, 18 years, and I've seen all the changes also from print and, and boards and to the digital world. And um, as much as I like focusing on SEO and just looking at traffic and looking at, uh, at the, the statistics, I think that if we lose the storytelling and if we lose the quality, and then we're on a, a, a wrong path. So my main focus is also to, to try to cherish the storytelling and the uniqueness and then find the brand that you want to work with, not based on who ranks higher on Google, but uh, passion. And uh, I see there's a lot of passionate people creating great content here from Nepal. And I know that everybody here that I've been talking to loves being here and it shows. If you only think of statistics, it doesn't show. So that's in travel blogging and content creating, you need passion. Right, um, namaste. Uh, my name is Lex Timbu. Um, I'm a blogger, not necessarily a travel blogger specifically, but it's something that I've started from. <laughs> it's something that I started from uh, back in around 2008, I believe. I'm someone who's based in London, and along the way, being a non-resident Nepali, I thought it was very important for uh, people like myself who have spent majority of their lives outside of Nepal to gain a really deep and um, a unique experience in Nepal, which so sometimes so many people who are of non-Nepali background come and seek uh, in Nepal, and I feel like we weren't getting that. Uh, a lot of my friends weren't getting that, and in 2014, my friend and I um, established Tracing Nepal, um, and we'll probably talk about travel media then and now as well, but um, going back to I really have to um, add on to your point that as a blogger, I write, write about social issues development, and I have seen how important that tourism can act as a tool for development, especially in the mountain communities, as well as realizing that Especially after the earthquake, I feel like majority of us Nepalis suddenly realize how important digital media is in putting the message out there as well. So I'm sure we can talk about that later on. So carrying on, uh, uh, just a small context. Actually, people earlier, you know, traveler, they were they used to. This is my submission. They used to research a lot about the place they are going, and now they are putting uh, effort how to portray that place, you know, how to put that uh, place on their pictures or, or in their stories. Uh, our traveler, they have become more prompt without, you know, more information. They just landed and they more towards creating content out of it. So do you believe the fact that, you know, like, uh, earlier traveler used to research with maps and these all, now they have stopped doing or they are doing less? What is your thing? So let's start with this. Oh, the way travel is researched has definitely changed. And uh, I think you gave some really interesting statistics that more travelers have a, have a phone than a toothbrush. Is that what you said? No, not travelers. Worldwide data is that. I they see, have a right. More than toothbrush. right. In any case, if that's the case, then yes, travelers are, are researching in different ways. And they're certainly going to their phones, their, um, their computers, a lot more than they are. Um, but again, the storytelling is, it has not changed. 
But no, I, th I have to credit Nepal for, for recognizing that the wave of the future is digital. And so to, you know, you're, you're certainly one of the few destinations that I know that uh, organizes a travel bloggers conference every year. And so I do think that's quite, that's quite the right way to go. And uh, one thing I would not caution, but one thing I would, and I think you, you are doing it, is that not every blogger is the same. Every blogger and influencer influences because they've got a certain angle, right? And uh, so you have to think about what it is you're trying, who are you trying to reach? And yesterday there was a lot of talk about sustainability and uh, numbers and, and cautioning against over-tourism. So you don't want your, to reach your 200 or 2 million people, 2 million travelers. You want the you want two million of the right kind of travelers if you're gonna have two million travelers. Uh, so, because otherwise you, you get into the point of diminishing return. So if you're approaching it at, from a digital strategy, you want the right kind of bloggers as well with a certain kind of angle. And it, you know, whether they're top bloggers or whether they're high engagement, you wanna make sure that you are reaching the right kind of, um, the right kind of travelers that you want coming in. Um. I definitely agree that there's been a huge shift in how people access travel media and in terms of how one plans their journey. But I think we also have to realize that just because there's a huge growing section of the population that are now accessing information through the tap of their smartphones and they have really little attention span does not mean that we should forget the people who still rely on traditional forms of media, like um, whether it's uh, still looking through magazines, books, and so on. Um, and I think that's sometimes because there's that rush and there's that desperation to be modern, to be digital, I feel that we will be leaving people behind. Just because we know that there's a huge um, percentage of young people in the world doesn't mean that we just suddenly forget the people who probably have a lot of money. Um, so going back to the same thing, that is, as you said, um, there's a huge need that we need to focus not necessarily on numbers, but on quality. Uh, quality people, quality um, experiences that Nepal needs to provide. When I started backpacking, it was like Lonely Planet, the book was, was the Bible. Like you, you bring it and you would follow it. Um, it was from last year's edition and it was already outdated. So I think the, the main difference now is that we can be updated all the time. So if you update your website with the, with the right information, if the bloggers are also updating all the content, then you have like an, um, a status of how it is right now. So it's, it's just also very different than, uh, than the printed versions when we were, were backpacking and uh, reading the book. Um, but I think also um, we can get more inspiration that is very targeted to each market and to each niche. Um, and also smaller destinations can um, market very specific to target countries that they don't even have the resources to create a website for. Like you cannot have 160 different languages for your website. So using travel bloggers and uh, content creators in their native language, promoting your destination, it's like an enhancement of your marketing department. So it's also, um, I think there's, there's m much more content uh, in native languages uh, available than just in English or just in, in uh, local. So I think it also changes. We can give uh, advice on how to travel. And I know the Norwegian market, I'm Norwegian. I write in Norwegian and I can, I can say how uh, my readers or my market like to travel. I know their, their mind, I know how they behave when they're traveling and I know what they will look for. Um, a UK blogger would not have the same opportunity to understand my readers. So it's also you get um, deeper understanding of each market when you work with content creators uh, around the world. So, you know, the shift, uh, I was uh, focusing more on the shift of uh, priorities. Uh, you, you have mentioned that we all were brought up with Lonely Planet guidebook, right? So for any destination we start, uh, we want to go, we started with a book and their description and their narratives, we believe that. Now, uh, people are more following their, you know, friends who have traveled on their social media, you know. And the, the, these things have made, made them decisive for, for opt for destination, okay. 
So how far countries like us, you know, can benefit from this kind of trend change, you know, because people now no longer they are more turning books and these all for referrals. They are going for suggestions of uh, people nearby and a kind of thing that social media brings to them on their mobile. They are, uh, you know, uh, taking them as decisive factor for opting for any destination, destination at their travel. So how destination like us can benefit from this trend? Can I go from you? So word of mouth, WOM, <laughs> is really the best form of, of influence. Um, if a friend of yours, if a brother of yours, if somebody tells you to do something, you, you, you trust that information. And so and it goes farther along as, as you get by. And I obviously come from National Geographic, which, which has something different. It's not word of mouth, but it's authority. And so you've got two different ways of, of, of reaching uh, reaching people. Um, but in terms of word of mouth, um, there is a lot of influence there. And so I think with using influencers, using bloggers, uh, using, you want to, you want to get the passion across and because passion is what, if people are passionate, they're going to come back again and again. You won't have a single uh, visitor to Nepal. You'll have a many ton visitor, which would, which would be so much easier. Um, so no, people do, people do have influence, and uh, the more you can use word of mouth, passion, influence. I, you know, I know the influence I have. I'm not a big influencer on uh, social media. I mean, I, I focus my influence on the travel trade, but I know that my actions and my words do carry weight. And so images, words do matter. Uh, one example I can think of is that I always carry this around wherever I go. And it is, I, know, I, know, I don't even have to say I don't use plastic. I just carry it around. I'll, I'll be photographed with it and all of that. So it, it's kind, it, it is influence. And so when looking at a destination, you have to look at the, what are the different passion points? What are people going to get incredibly passionate about? Um, and then focus your attention that way. Because passion, you know, if people are passionate, you can just automatically you automatically get get moved by that. So it's it's you know where where are the touch points? Where are the narratives? Where are the um, the points of passion in in anything in your product, in a destination, in a hotel, in in, in a restaurant? I think it's also an opportunity to show uh, the whole country and different seasons and different activities. And by by spreading also the tourism, the tourists that you get. If you're, you can also, in a certain way, avoid over-tourism. Because it's, uh, it's a danger also to be too influential. Like if all the bloggers here went to one single spot and took a, an incredible photo, and then you would have more people wanting to have that exact photo from that exact spot. So if you, if you are able to kind of show the beauty of the whole country, and, and different uh, activities and culture and nature and, and just like an overview of everything, then you can also, um, you cannot avoid over tourism, but you can in a certain way control it. As you, there, there are so many things that is wrong with Instagram, I cannot even start, but it's <laughs> like, yes. Um, but but uh, ruining, uh, single spots is one of them. Like people will, will die before they cannot have that one photo. And why do people want to copy each other all the time? I don't really understand that. Like there are 10,000 photos of that exact same spot and you still want to go there to take the exact same photo because then you're influential or, or something like that. So um, there's also a movement on Instagram because everything has become very fake, very staged, very um, photoshopped. And there's also like a shift now towards more authentic and uh, unfiltered and, and uh, more real travel. So I'm hoping to see more of that from all of you uh, in the future. So Yannick, I'd like to join a supplement question and I'll, I'll come back to you, Lex. So, uh, you know, campaign like um, 
real me has started you know if you talk about the person uh, so we um, uh, people have started uh, showing their real faces which is not photoshopped which is not uh, you know adulterated something like that so uh, if it comes to destination like that uh, you know we've been showing bright uh, mountains you know bright colored um, lakes and these all with the shadows of mountain on it over it uh, but the reality is always not same because people go with the same kind of perception over that like that you know uh, when campaign like real me can influence people on a personal level like that so can destination benefit uh, by showing the real picture of destination you know where people are doing activities where they seem to be not uh, proper but uh, people might be interested can such kind of pictures find place and influence uh, visitors to come over if you oversell your destination everybody who comes there will be super disappointed so it's not a good start okay. so it's better to in my opinion, it's better to undersell and over-deliver than oversell and under-deliver, <laughs> you know. Um, but I think it's also, like, you cannot control the people that is putting up photos from Nepal. But if you work with travel influencers, you can, in a certain way, control what kind of style you want. And you can also brief them when you are, are talking with, uh, like, what kind of project, what is, the, what is our goal of this. So if your goal is to show the authentic... Nepal, then you could choose the bloggers that you are confident on want want to show the the authentic Nepal and not a stage version or a Photoshop version, because there are there are too many things going. As I said, there are too many things with Instagram that is wrong. There's bot followers, there's bot likes, there's uh, fake accounts and fake. Everything is is um, very fake. But um, if you pick the right ones you can also get quality because Instagram works as inspiration. So if you see enough photos from Nepal that looks inspirational, the real Nepal, then you will seek more information. And the more information is how to travel there, where's the best things to do, um, I want to go uh, on adventure in Nepal, where do I go, um, how do I get a visa, you know, all these kind of practical things, but also find inspiration. So uh, all the bloggers here are multi-channel bloggers, so they have a blog, they have Instagram, they have Twitter, they have uh, Pinterest, and so you can find, like, every social media, um, and it, it works differently. So Instagram is for inspiration. And if we can give the right inspiration and not the fake inspiration, then they can go deeper and uh, find more concrete um, stories and, uh, and passion about the country. So I think you need to work on all levels. But if you only work with like one channel uh, influencers like Instagram, there's no more deeper knowledge about the place. And it's very... And the text in, in, in Instagram is very short, so it doesn't really give that much information. But as an inspiration, it works. So I'm using it as an inspiration, and then my readers know that there is more coming on the blog afterwards. So, Lex? <clears throat> I think I'll go back to your first uh, question. Um, coming back to, I think what Nepal did really well was after the earthquake, there was a huge desperation to let everyone else know that, you know what, hashtag Nepal now. This is what Nepal now looks like, and we're still okay. Certain parts of the country are still okay, and we're more than happy for you guys to come and visit us, right? And I think what happened after that was, because of where we are as a nation in terms of our connectivity to internet, internet penetration, I believe more people have... Um, access to a mobile phone than uh, a toilet uh, in our country. So then the Nepali people from Nepal took it as their responsibility to promote their country, right? Which was amazing. But now I do believe that there are certain areas in the country like Mustang, Mardi Hima, which is very overpopulated, all right? And what we need to think about is, or maybe certain actors need to get involved in liaising with these individuals and taking them to promote certain areas, you know, because maybe we can kind of direct that flow as well. Because if every individual accessing YouTube is seeing Mardi Himal Trek and just staying in tea lodges, then somebody else might think, you know what, I'm not gonna go to Nepal because I've never been a person who um, goes to tea lodges and uses a squat toilet. So there's a, and we cannot control what somebody puts up, but we can try our best to kind of navigate uh, the route to the areas that people are promoting and I think that's really important with how we want to go because I keep reading articles and there's that huge pressure. We're getting increasing numbers but there's less spending, 
all right? I'm not too sure regarding what the rationale behind that may be, but it might be something that we have to think about as what people see of Nepal when they think or when they search Nepal uh, first and foremost. One thing I'd like to add is that uh, Peru, the country of Peru did something really interesting. As you know, Peru, similar to, to Nepal, has one big icon that outshines everything else. Actually, it outshines everything in South America. Um, but what they've done, having seen the over-tourism in, um, in Machu Picchu, is the tourist board really started to pinpoint areas of the country, socioeconomically depressed areas of the country, in order to focus attention on that. They first built infrastructure, because that's important. You can't just send a bunch of tourists over to where, where on trails that are fragile and sensitive and you know, thousands of year old um, um, uh, sites, archeological sites. They pinpointed an area, um, just one example, they pinpointed an area in the north um, that was economically depressed. There is a pre-Incan site, it, it precedes the Incas, um, that they call the Machu Picchu of the, of the north. It's called Quelap. Um, put a lot of money into building the infrastructure, trails, enhanced the tra trails and all of that. As the next step, they brought in a lot of uh, travel writers, media, bloggers, et cetera, to, uh, to experience it on, on their own terms. So they didn't, you know, there were no um, things that you had to do, but essentially experience the area. And then now you are seeing uh, Quelap, Chachapoyas, these areas, uh, coming up on search feeds uh, all the time, on, on search terms all the time. And so th that's a way, you know, and it was, it, it doesn't say don't go to Machu Picchu, but there are other things now that people are, are, are looking at. And um, I may be the first person that, had gone to, that has gone to Peru and not seen Machu Picchu. I've, I've yet to see Machu Picchu, um, and, but I have seen Quelap. So we'll be taking questions. Before that, I'd like to um, uh, say something about this, um, uh, the bloggers who are present here today. Uh, you've been selected from rigorous uh, you know, process. We have asked you to submit uh, your work, and uh, you're, you've given us online links of the works you've done so far, and we have checked uh, your, you know, um, work, uh, your, your website on Google Analytics and everything. We. Uh, we come up with a lot of submissions, and from submissions, we could select only a few of you. You, you, can, you could make it here, so big round of applause to all of you here present. And thank you for coming, and I, we believe that you'll definitely carry good masses of Nepal from here and uh, help us promote Nepal. So I open the floor for questions. Yes, so uh, your name and questions and brief. Can anyone help with a mic over there? Uh, I'm Sandy and he's Vijay. We are a couple uh, travel bloggers. Uh, so uh, we see there's a shift uh, towards video. Uh, more and more people are uh, creating uh, video content. So we want to know uh, what's the future for content writing, travel blog posts. The future for travel writing, travel blogs is bright. <laughs> Uh, because sometimes you don't have the time or the, the bandwidth to watch a video. Like sometimes you just want that information or that inspirational story. So, um, but what we see a shift for the last three, two, three years is, um, let's go back eight years, everybody was writing travel blogs. And then social media came along and wow, everybody was so breathtaking about all these different platforms and they started to focus more on the social media platforms than their, their blog. And now we see that you don't own your social media channels. If Instagram closes down tomorrow, there's a lot of people that would be disappointed. There's a lot of people that would be out of business. But if you have your blog, that's your own, um, your own content and you own that content then nobody can kind of, uh, unless, <laughs> unless internet shuts down, then, then it's there. But I, but I think that writing is uh, um, a... 
sometimes is more useful, but video is also very inspirational. So usually you would do a mix of everything. You would do a mix of writing, social media, photo, video, and just be everywhere, but focus on what your passion is. And that's, uh, if it's vlogging, then it's uh, great. But also if it's blogging, then focus on the content and focus on the passion of what you're writing. Because you don't want to be a content factory. You don't want to just like puke content, 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 that is just SEO optimized because there's no passion about it. Yeah, I have, I have a related question to what you just said. And uh, you had mentioned that uh, you need to balance between storytelling and uh, SEO. I mean, optimizing your article or post for SEO. Uh, Can we get sound on the mic? Oh, yeah. there. Okay, uh, I'll just repeat again. Uh, so you had spoken about uh, storytelling, which is the essential part of any uh, blog post, uh, but we need to optimize it for SEO as well. Uh, so it's all about striking the right balance, uh, because if you want your post to rank, uh, you need to do that. But at the same time, you do not want to dilute your storytelling. So any tips on how to achieve that kind of a balance? All your content on your blog doesn't have to be the same. Like some blog posts are long and, and deep and go really in depth in, in what you're, you, you, you want to, to write about. And some are lighter and uh, more accessible. But what you do very effectively with uh, driving traffic to the SEO optimized blog post and then you have internal links that will lead them to, to gain more information. Which is like, a, like internal linking, is, it's a, an art of its own. But if you're doing it right, you will also drive more traffic into to your, the blog post that is really passion and, and that is really you. But yes, you need a, a mix of both and you need also to SEO optimize certain parts of uh, your pure storytelling uh, pieces as well. But a mix of everything is good. Like there's no newspaper that has only articles of 1500 words or only... Um, so you have some smaller, some teasers, and some, some uh, deeper, and some maybe more photo heavy, and some not that photo heavy, and mix in some video. So I think it's just finding a balance that um, if you want to find some easy like, things to do in, in Kathmandu, you can have an, a blog post about these kind of small, small teasers. But if you have internal linking that also goes deeper into those those uh, things that you describe, then you will also drive more traffic. Thank so, you. Uh, before I take more questions, I'd like to just add on the same question that, uh, see, the world is now debating on content versus, uh, you know, curation or something like that. You know, uh, content is there and promotion, both ends. Let's see the both ends. Uh, to the country like us, uh, we are more towards organic content because we have not uh, much more of paid promotions. Uh, things we are doing so far is all organically created, our own pictures, you know, and videos that has been created uh, um, by ourselves or by our content generators that has not been marketed with a paid marketing or something like that. We've been doing so far uh, good. Uh, so how you see uh, the future of uh, bloggers, you know, because uh, the bloggers I see they are now, you know, in dilemma, I have to promote myself more or I have to focus more on content. So what should be the focus now, you know, uh, if you want to really want to stand as a professional one and really want to help destination like us? When I was coming here, because this is my first time in Nepal, so when I was coming here, I wanted to put up a nice photo from Nepal and um, a little text that will prepare my readers that this is where I'm going, follow me on this and this hashtag. Uh, and uh, I went to Nepal tourism website right. and tried to find press photos so I could download, like because I, I want to use pictures that are not um, copyright that I'm, I'm not entitled to. And to be honest, there was not much inspiration to find. <laughs> so maybe if you want also traditional media to promote Nepal and to have like good uh, content so they can like both text and, and but pictures is also because pictures or videos, this is the kind of like that catches your eyes and then you can start reading. So to be honest, I could not find a photo that would, uh, would uh, catch my reader's eyes on that media bank. I think it was only like 20, 25 pictures. And so maybe work on, there's a lot of great photographers here. A lot of great photographers. 
that can, can really also show the authentic parts and uh, different viewpoints of Nepal. So purchase photos from the bloggers that are here. They are here and they have uh, thousands of photos in their, in their uh, card. So that's, that's one tip that you can utilize with uh, the bloggers that are here. So they are already submitting their pictures because we have hosted them. <laughs> so anyway, so just a quick answer to our question. Actually, we are coming up with, uh, you know, user-generated submitted uh, forum platform for pictures that will be called Photo Nepal that will be starting soon. We have, you know, done all preparations for it. So I think we'll be sharing the link of it. And I request everyone uh, here present to submit beautiful pictures over the platform we'll be sharing with you. Yes. And before we leave this topic, um, Sudan, I, I wanted to remind you and everyone that there, there is such a thing called traditional media and earned media. And so this, this is not the topic of this panel, so we're very focused right now on bloggers and paid media and all of that. But there is a difference now. There is a difference. There didn't used to be, but there is a difference. So there's earned media. So this is the National Geographic, the outsides, the, the traditional outlets that that um, you do not actually have to pay to, to get in. And I would argue that Nepal has many incredible stories. You just have to get the attention of the earned media. Um, so reaching out to traditional media uh, can be quite valuable as well. Um, just to add on to that, because you talked about how the power of storytelling is so important, and Nepal is a country where, you know, even if you close your eyes and do not see the mountains or the rhinos, etc., the people and the culture, I feel, we have yet to actually translate or bring those stories um, and deliver it or write it in the essence of what they actually provide. And I feel like maybe that's an opportunity for um, Nepali-speaking bloggers or Nepali-speaking bloggers from anywhere, because we have experts from all over the world, to come to create those stories, to capture, and maybe put it on the NTB website and so on as well. Uh, because, you know, to come over here and to take a picture of an amazing, beautiful scenery and to go away, it's one thing, but if you could support that with some incredible story, I feel like that's gonna make a more of an impact and we need to kind of put the shift on our amazing culture and about, we have over 120 ethnicities in this country and I think if certain countries attract tourists for the culture and the amazing uh, traditions, why can't Nepal do that as well? So if, if you're thinking about the, the self-published uh, content creators, the bloggers, the vloggers, the Instagrammers, and compared to traditional media, um, you might not agree with me, but uh, traditional media finds inspiration for their next, what, what they will target next from social media, from bloggers, from vloggers. So working with, uh, with content creators that are self-published will also attract traditional media. And now she doesn't gonna, agree. No, I'm, I, I, I'm not going to disagree with you. No, I, I, I agree. We get our information through many, many sources. Um, and a lot of it t is through the trade because we follow the trade as well because we want to be kind of ahead of the curve. So... So, but yes, no, I, I would certainly agree that we, um, as traditional media has shrunk in staff. Um, back in the day, National Geographic used to send a photographer, a writer, years ahead for many, many, many months at a time. These days, that does not exist anymore. Um, now, I work for Travel uh, Magazine, which never had that kind of, uh, that, those kinds of budgets, but we did have a lot more time, a lot more staff, a lot, we were able to do a lot more on the ground, on the ground reporting. These days, that's really not the case, so we do rely on outreach, um, other experts, to, to make some of our decisions. So, so yes, I don't, I don't disagree. So I think with you. working with bloggers here and uh, also other content creators in the future will also attract more traditional media and get a different kind of coverage. Yes, actually, uh, uh, Nuri and Yankee, let me tell you uh, both that we are working with traditional media like National Geographic, CNN, and BBC also, and also with uh, bloggers. Uh, they are present here today like them also because we feel both the ends are you know, powerful these days and we don't have to skip one for another. They have their own medium and we have to reach uh, equally to them. So I'd like to invite questions more. Please raise, yes, I can see a few hands there. Good afternoon. I'm Arna from India. I run a travel blog called Eat, Travel, Live, Repeat for the past two years. So I just want to know your thoughts about this thing. Like, 
I'm a master's student doing, uh, un doing tourism and hospitality. So, like, we create content. There's a lot of content being created. So, how do you find a perfect balance between content creating and sharing it? Like, is there, like, I found the 80-20 rule to be applicable. So, what are your thoughts on this thing? I, I'm not sure I understood the question. So when we create content, the amount of time we use to create content, yeah. so is there a specific ratio, like if you spend two hours in creating content, you should spend two hours in promoting it? Or what sort of a thing? Because the there's no point creating creation content and promotion. And if no one is reading it. Yeah, you can promote your content in different ways. You can have, uh, of course, your social media sharing. You can have a newsletter. You can, uh, but you can also use the content that you create the next month or the next year. It depends on, on what the content is. So I think it's more important to, to find a balance on what, what this piece actually represents. So do you want to put it up on, is it the top 10, 10 things to do or is it very like super um, photo heavy? You can put it on, 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 uh, on Pinterest with lots of different pins like spread out. But if it's not that photo heavy and it's like more, then you can just focus on one. So I think it's also what kind of content it is and what kind of audience you're after. Um, and if you use Facebook, uh, of course, you can boost it. You can target the, the right audience that you want to, to attract to this type of article. But I think the most important thing with, with bloggers today is to not only create new content, but to, to keep the content that they have up to date, because everybody knows that um, the older content gets easier, more traffic. So just keeping them updated and keeping them um, SEO optimized is like there's a there's a like a round every year you have to go uh, through the content. And I know it's time consuming, but I think it's it's more important to focus on on quality on your blog than social media promotion. But don't forget it. And I would also say to um, to tourism board. Like even I know there's going to come a lot of, of content now. You don't have to share and uh, like um, use everything at once. So you can spread it out in different seasons, and you can also reuse it. So not just only like next year or the year after, but check the content if it's still up to date, if it's still uh, what aligns in your campaigns, then share it. It's, it's content that is already there. It's free. It's, uh, it's free to share it, and it's a win-win it's a for both, both sides. So you get the promotion, the blogger gets more traffic, and um, yeah, so working together would also will push your content higher up in Google, even though it's not on your platform. Any yeah, more questions? Uh, uh, yep. I, I am Angelica and I write at Pendown. So I was about to come at the point that, you know, everybody has been uh, updating a lot. We've been tweeting, we have been Instagramming and updating on Facebook, but I see the sharing is very less from Nepal Tourism Board. I mean, uh, there are hardly few people who are sharing it. And I believe that right now we are doing it while we are here. There should have been a lot of more interaction. I even suggested the kids here, the one who have been uh, helping us out through everything because they also have a lot of things that they can support us. We are talking about Nepal. They should be happy sharing those content. So I would request you all to be there and you know support our work to promote your country. Request accepted. Thank you. We talked about traditional media versus online media. So right. I do a lot of work for traditional media even today. And my stories are put by those traditional medias onto their websites also. So how do I relate these two with the brands? Did you get the question? No, I didn't really get the Can you put the I mic mean, closer? Traditional media print stories and uh, their website stories. Like if I do a story on XYZ, it goes onto their online website also, and the story, same story is printed there. If I use the same story on my blogs, I run into a problem called plagiarism, duplication mm -hmm. and everything else. So how do I establish a relation between all these three platforms, traditional media, traditional media, online platforms, and my own blogs? 
Well, if you put the same story, and I'm not talking about the printed, but if you put the same story, like exact same words in, in two different platforms, if you don't put... Uh, no, I don't remember, but you need to put... Uh, um, hey, yes. Yeah, because if if you, if you have the same story on two platforms or in, on two websites, it's uh, it's uh, Google sees it as copy. copy, yes, and it will will downgrade both. So do I need to change my stories if, I, if they go onto my platform, my blog platform? Do I need to change my story from my what I have on traditional media? Sorry, my okay. I I would write. Um, I would write a new story. Like, do you want the, st the same story on a traditional media online mm -hmm. that on your blog? I would think maybe you should be more personal with your blog stories. Okay, first hand yeah. experience. And you need to also SEO optimize it. And it's not the same for a written article that is printed because you don't actually need to SEO optimize anything e there. Exactly. So, yeah. All right. Uh, so let's make it a last question, then okay. we'll wrap up, yes. I'm Ramesh Tiwari from Nepal. Uh, just do you have an uh, idea of, uh, concerning the total number of travel bloggers around the world? The total number of travel bloggers? Yeah, yeah. I have no idea. Oh. I have no idea. Yeah. No. So some of us uh, might turn travel blogger from uh, this day, so we don't have data as, as we keep on evolving. So uh, coming to, uh, back to the uh, last gentleman's questions, uh, I'd like to add that you know, platforms are different. You know, if, you are, if you want to create a content for, let's say, mass media, your content has to be specific, different. You're targeting the different mass, you know? And if you're going for social media, then you have to be more interactive. You have to invite more interaction. So uh, maybe the content, we have to work uh, more on content and how to make it more interactive. That is the key, I think. So I think that justifies your question. And um, before we say it, it's done for this, you know, forum. I, I have a last question to ask. You, all three of you, you have been to Nepal for a few days, and what is one factor, one product we have to carry more, you know, to portray Nepal as a prime tourism destination? So what comes in your mind? Just one product. Yes. I've only been in Nepal for four days. <laughs> So, however, what I will say is what struck me, again, it's very limited knowledge at this point, but what has struck me, um, and it's been said before, again, and it's, a, it's been said again and again, it's, it's the people, and that if you can showcase people's voices, um, I, I work a lot in indigenous tourism, and you have a wealth, a wealth of voices, uh, a wealth of voices, so let, let people hear those voices, and um, I think it speaks for itself. I feel like you basically said what I wanted to Sorry. say. But yeah, <laughs> say for, it again. For me, it's the people as well. Half the time, I wasn't really you know, taking pictures of so the surrounding, but it was actually the people and understanding um, them. And I feel like I was in a very privileged position to be able to uh, do that and get their stories. So um, the energy, the energy, and you know, as a Nepali person, for me, it doesn't get old. Um, so it's, it's actually that. And to be able to translate that. And uh, the, the people, my Langtang family who went to Langtang, so the majority of them are people who have been to Nepal second time, third time, and they say it's the, one of the countries with the most friendliest people in the world, you know? Um, and I think um, I speak on behalf of them as well when I say it's the people. people. Yeah, because you, you have fantastic nature and uh, unique sites and, and everything, but I also, I'm very passionate about the culture, so bring more of the culture, and uh, including the people. But also the, the, the dancing, the handicrafts, the, the food, like everything, because that's what it's like to, to really experience a destination, to taste and to feel and to, to just be in the destination. I think uh, that's it. Uh, we, uh, we need to you know, end this panel on time. And thank you for the wonderful panel we have here. Big round of applause to all the three of them. <laughs> Nori Quintus, uh, Yankee Hansen, and Lex Limbu, and the wonderful audience. Big round of applause to you as well. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you. So uh, we have a small token of appreciation, a memento to be offered uh, to uh, 
uh, speaker, Mr. Lex Limbu, as well as our moderator for today, Mr. Sudan Subedi. So here, I would like to request our board member of Nepal Tourism Board, Mr. Avdesh Das, to please be on stage to offer a memento to our speaker as well as our, our moderator here. So let's give a huge round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, uh, thank you so much.